Good afternoon, everyone. We're very pleased to have Chef Mary Berg with us today to share one of her wonderful recipes. So Mary Berg is the host of Kitchen Crush, author of best-selling cookbook, Kitchen Party, Effortless Recipes for Every Occasion that we do own at the library, and the season three winner of CTV's MasterChef Canada. A self-taught home cook, Mary's signature style of reimagining culinary classics while maintaining the original heart of the dish has helped make a passion of cooking for those she loves into her full-time dream job. Today, Mary will present one of her recipes, a baking recipe, and afterward we'll have the opportunity for a chat and a question period. Thank you so much, Mary, for joining us today from your home in Toronto, and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I am so excited to be here. Uh, it's always good to uh, get to reach out and, and meet new people, whether it's through these online platforms and, and Zoom calls, uh, it's really anything. I'm, I'm kind of really uh, silver lining looking for those those um, positives, especially right now. And uh, and this is one of them. You get to meet so many people you didn't know you were, you were gonna meet and, and uh, reach out in that way. So thank you for having me. Um, like everybody said, I'm gonna be showing a super simple recipe right now for one of my all time favorite summer dishes and that is for strawberry shortcakes. Now, yes, I love a classic kind of angel food cake version of a strawberry shortcake, but right now with, with how we have to shop and how we can't go out all the time, never in my wildest dreams would I ever try to ask you to make a cake that requires 12 egg whites, because what the heck are you going to do with 12 egg yolks uh, in, uh, after you make that cake? So I'm doing the more classic version of a strawberry shortcake. Um, I'm doing the one where there's a biscuit uh, and then a nice cream uh, with some nice macerated strawberries. So super simple, really delicious, and hopefully something you can do with what you have in the pantry. And there are some different uh, substitutes that I'll mention along the way too, just in case you don't have anything. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is... Uh, work with flour. Now I'm using all purpose here, but you could use cake and pastry. The only one I would avoid is bread flour. If you wanted, you could do even whole wheat, but they will be a little more dense, but there's nothing wrong with that. To be honest, it would just taste slightly more like a cookie than a cake, which yes, please. Uh, so here I've got a cup and a half of all purpose flour that I'm just going to toss into a bowl. Super easy. And then to that, I'm gonna add in two tablespoons of sugar. Now, shortcakes aren't really all that sweet. Uh, they are more short, that's kind of the name. They're supposed to be crumbly and almost biscuity. Um, so that little bit of sugar just helps kind of shorten everything up, but give it a, a little bit of sweetness, giving you kind of that dessert feel. Now into there, we're also adding a full tablespoon, which is a lot, of baking powder. What the baking powder does is it helps give that puffy rise, that kind of biscuity layered rise that you're looking for in a shortcake. Finally, for the dry ingredients, I'm gonna add in a little bit of salt. This is just half a teaspoon of kosher salt. Now, if you don't have kosher salt, feel free to use table salt or even sea salt. I would just cut the amount in half. So as opposed to using half a teaspoon, I would use a quarter teaspoon. Kosher salt has a really nice kind of soft salt flavor, whereas table salt and sea salt is really kind of ocean, bright, briny. Uh, so it's a little bit stronger. So I usually cut back if a recipe calls for kosher and I'm using sea salt. Okay, so that's it for dry, it's super simple. If you wanted, you could also add in some spices, maybe some grated nutmeg or some cinnamon would be absolutely amazing. Um, this is one of those recipes that you can kind of make your own with whatever you have on hand, which is great. All right, now all of those dry ingredients are all mixed up, easy peasy. Now what I'm gonna do is add in kind of the wet. I'm gonna start with butter though. So as opposed to uh, like you'd make a cake or something where the butter's creamed with the sugar and everything, this butter is actually cut in more like a pie dough. Because what you want when you're making a shortcake is that kind of flaky layering. And when you cut the butter in, so it's in those little kind of pea-sized pieces, what that does is it gives you a little bit of steam escape when it melts in the oven. So when this butter, this cold butter, hits the heat of the oven, a little bit of uh, moisture evaporates, causing steam, which is a little pocket, and pockets equal flaky, which is delicious. All right, 
So I've got six tablespoons of butter here. And if you don't have butter, feel free to use, uh, to be honest, shortening would be fine. You won't have that buttery flavor. Or if you wanted to do half and half shortening and butter, great. Lard, if you have it, I know it's a little bit more shelf stable. Just make sure it's ice cold. And if you wanted to go vegan or vegetarian kind of more side, um, cold uh, coconut oil actually works really, really well. You just have to be in and out of the freezer a lot because it melts really quickly. So. Butter, now I'm just using a paring knife and I'm cutting kind of towards my thumb, uh, which looks scarier than it is. To be honest, this is how you're supposed to hold a paring knife because what it does is you have more control and you're less likely to cut yourself, which is good. Um, but if you're nervous, feel free to use just a normal cutting uh, board and a knife. Strawberry shortcakes to me have always been one of my absolute favorites. Ever since I was a kid, again, I loved that angel food cake with those syrupy strawberries and arguably more whipped cream than anyone should ever eat in a single serving. Uh, but to me, that just says summertime. And we'll get to the strawberries in a second, but the thing that I really love is with these shortcakes, right now, peach season is hitting, which is amazing. So you could even do peach shortcakes, which sounds pretty good to me. You could do cherry shortcakes. And if you don't have fresh strawberries, just a dollop of strawberry jam on there is absolutely delicious. Okay, this is where I get messy. So I've got my hands, and what I want to do is kind of toss all this butter into the flour mixture. That just kind of coats every piece with a little bit of flour, and that makes it so it doesn't kind of blend in in a, in a mushy way. So then, once all the pats are covered, what I like to do is I pick up the pats and I kind of press and rub them out. So kind of like, um, kind of like you're counting money or papers or something like that. Because what you're doing now is you're basically just breaking up the butter into tiny little pieces so it gets distributed evenly throughout this batter or this dough. And then you get all those little pockets, which if you don't have pockets in a shortcake, it's going to be more of a rock cake, which, um, you know, if uh, you guys are avid readers and like fantasy like me, you would think of Hagrid. Uh, and I don't want to bake like Hagrid personally. Other things, sure, but not baking. All right. So I just kind of do that until the mixture resembles almost like a crumbly, coarse uh, cracker crumb. So you know the end of a bag of saltines where there's like hunks of cracker in there? That's kind of what you're looking for in and amongst all the flour. So for those who are watching on Zoom, I can show you kind of what this looks like. So if you can see the flour, here, I'm getting a little bit too... Oh, the sun's too bright today, but it basically is in, I'll do it. It's kind of clumpy. See those couple clumps? That's what you're looking for. So done. Now I kind of do a clapping to get it off of my hands. And now for the actual wet ingredients in this dough. The only thing I need is buttermilk. Now, right now, I don't have buttermilk and I didn't want to have to run to the store because we're not supposed to run to the store anytime we we think of it now. So what I've got here is I've got two thirds to uh, about three quarters of a cup of milk. I use whole milk because that's just what I always have on hand. 2% would be fine as well. And I'm going to add in a little bit of vinegar. I have apple cider vinegar. White vinegar is great. Uh, to be honest, white wine vinegar would be good. Just steer clear of like balsamic or those really flavorful vinegars because that'll just taste weird. So I'm going to add in about half a teaspoon of vinegar into that milk. And what that's gonna do is kind of sour it. And the reason you use buttermilk in recipes like this and, uh, and recipes that, that have baking powder and baking soda is because that little bit of acid helps to activate that baking powder or baking soda, um, kind of like when you'd make a, a baking soda volcano when you were a kid. And it makes it puff up and it gives you a lighter, nicer rise on your biscuits or your shortcakes. So into the bowl. And then, just with your wooden spoon or spatula, I just mix it together just until it almost comes together. Now, if you're like me, you're going to want to add more milk. Um, but don't, because that will lead to a slightly more cookie-like uh, cake, and we want these to be nice and short. So just until it comes together into a dough, we've got it. So that is what it looks like already. So I've got a little flour here. I'm going to put that down on my board. Then I'm just going to transfer this onto my board. 
And anytime I make shortcakes, I forget that I have kind of monster hands after, but that's okay. And then with this batter, I'm gonna put a little, or this dough, I'm gonna put a little bit more flour on top. And just kind of press it down. Sorry, it's a little sun like bleached, but you get the idea. Press it down and then you're gonna fold. So again, all we're doing with shortcakes is we're trying to get layers in there and we're trying to get a little bit of puffiness. So what we're doing with the folding is we're making layers, first of all, but we're also making it so butter kind of flattens out and gets longer. So that gives you more flakes and more pockets. So I'm gonna do that once, twice, let's do it one more time. Three times, lady, excellent. Super simple. Then I kind of square up the edges or you can round them off. Then I press it into about an inch thick. Not too thick, not too thin. You want your biscuits or your shortcakes nice and tall. A little bit more flour. Now, for shaping, you can do one of two options. You actually three options. You know, there's lots of options for shortcakes. You can leave it in a round and then cut it almost like you would a pie. So you get triangle shapes, which is delicious and kind of scony. Uh, you could use a knife and cut it into squares, which I've done with the versions that are going to come. Or you can even use a biscuit cutter or a cookie cutter, whichever. So a round guy, you could even use a glass if you have it. But basically all you do is press straight down and then twist. If you twist while you're pressing, it, it tends to break some of those layers you worked in, but that's what you end up with. A delicious looking yummy biscuit. Then I just pop these onto a sheet tray. If you want, you can line that with parchment paper or the dull side up of aluminum foil, which also works similarly to parchment paper. Um, but I'm just going straight on because there's some butter in there and it won't, they won't stick. Now, typically what I would do is gather up all of this remaining dough and kind of roll it into another one of these and get five or six biscuits, but to be honest, and this is like the cook's secret that you're not supposed to know if you're the, uh, the guest, is I just take this as a big old mass of dough and I throw it on there and that's my snack for when they come out. Nobody's gonna know, no one's gonna see it, and it's delicious. So, we've got our little biscuits here, as you can see, delicious. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get any of the remaining milk or buttermilk in there and just Divide it over the tops of the shortcakes. So what that does is it encourages a little bit of browning. And then just to hint that these are nice, sweet shortcakes. I've got some sugar. If you want, you can use um, turbinado sugar, which is really, really nice. That's the one sometimes called sugar in the raw. You get it at uh, coffee shops in the little brown sachets. Um, so if, those, if you have some of those lying around your bag, go with those. But I'm just gonna do regular white sugar. Just sprinkle a little bit on top, just to give a little bit of a crunch. And then these go into a 450 oven for anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes. What's gonna happen is they're gonna puff up, get golden brown and delicious, and uh, gonna be amazing. Your house is gonna smell so good. So, one sec. I've got some that I literally just made. So they are looking uh, I mean, pretty good if you can kind of see them. Really golden brown and delicious. I did these ones as squares. Now, shortcakes are done. What I need is the strawberries and the cream because those are a must when it comes to strawberry shortcakes. So, shortcakes done. For the strawberries, what I want to do is I've got about one of those classic clamshells of strawberries here. But again, if you wanted, you could use peaches, you could use cherries, anything like that would be delicious. Any kind of soft, tender fruit. So I've got that in there. And I'm gonna add in about a tablespoon or two of sugar. And what the sugar does is it kind of draws out some of the moisture in the strawberries. And it kind of doesn't cook down, but it, it, it draws out that moisture and creates an almost syrup with the strawberry juice. So it kind of concentrates the flavor of the strawberry and gives you a delicious juice to drizzle all over everything, which is pretty delicious in my books. Now, I'm also going to add in a little bit of vanilla. If you don't have vanilla, feel free to use any other extracts. Uh, almond extract would be delicious. You can sprinkle some almonds on those. So good. Or you can just leave them plain because let's be honest, plain old strawberries are amazing. I'm just going to mix that together. Super simple. If I wasn't yammering on, I would be done already because it's that easy of a recipe. 
And what I typically do is I'd let them sit for anywhere between 20 minutes to even overnight in the fridge. That's going to draw out that moisture, make it juicy and delicious. You could even, if you wanted, put a little splash of wine in there, red wine, white wine, rosé. Oh my gosh, so delicious and tasty. Or even something like Grand Marnier or an orange liqueur. Really, really good. And then finally, I've got whipping cream. So I've whipped some whipping cream, uh, about a cup, with a couple tablespoons of sugar just to sweeten it up a little bit. I like a bit of sugar in a dessert. And then I've also added, and this is a trick that I do for a couple reasons. I like the tang it gives, and I also really like the stability it gives whipped cream because it makes it stay. And that secret is a little bit of cream cheese. So into this cup of whipping cream, I also added in a quarter cup of uh, cream cheese. You can use brick cream cheese at room temperature or just like the tub that you'd spread on your bagel, anything like that. It stables it up so it doesn't um, weep or get too uh, runny. It's a great use for if you're decorating an easy casual cake so it doesn't kind of start getting um, drippy, if you know what I mean. So finally, Mary Berg, quit talking and make a, make a strawberry shortcake. So I have got a little plate and I'm gonna pick my prettiest one, and I think it's this one. Delicious. And because uh, this was the side that was folded, it's got a nice kind of angled rise to it, which I like. And like the layers, if you can see them. Goodness, look at those layers. Like, yes, please. Okay. And that's what all that folding and everything gets. So I'm going to split that open. If you're being traditional, you can use a fork. I'm not. <laughs> And these are still warm from the oven, so that whipped cream is going to weep a little bit and melt, but that's just going to make them so, so good. So onto there, I'm going to dollop a big old mess of this delicious sweetened cream cheese whipped cream. And some of these berries. And again, it's only, it's only two in the afternoon, so, but if you wanted, you could add a little bit of brandy in there. So tasty. Then the crowning glory, a little cap. And uh, you know what? Let's just throw a little berry on there for fun. And then, that is all she wrote. Delicious, simple, basically like a tea in no time flat in your kitchen. It takes no time at all. It's made with pretty much stuff that you'll probably have on hand, which is awesome. And even if you don't have the whipped cream, something like a little bit of vanilla yogurt would be delicious on here. Just some butter and jam would be absolutely amazing. Uh, and it's perfect for breakfast, brunch, a sweet treat in the afternoon, or even dessert in that little bubble, if you got your little bubble hanging around. But that's, uh, that's pretty much all she wrote. So um, yeah, I hope you make it. The, the recipe is up on my website, a smallstove.com. Um, but I, I've shared that with, uh, with the organizers today. And so, uh, and they can put that up on their, their website as well. So you guys have access to this recipe. Um, again, super simple, really customizable, which is always good when we're in a pandemic. So yeah, awesome. So thank you so much, Mary. That looks delicious. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> thank you for providing uh, a few alternatives for people to substitute uh, different ingredients. So tell me, what is your favorite version? Oh, gosh. I would have to go classic strawberry shortcake, though right now with peach season, especially here in Ontario with peach season starting to happen, because uh, the Niagara fruit belt, I think produces over 80% of Canada's peaches, but we got a lot. Um, and kind of as soon as I see those crop up at stores, I buy arguably too many and they go, they make their way into everything I make. That's great. Um, I'm sure the audience would like to know a little bit more about you. So uh, let's begin with your journey on uh, MasterChef season three. Can you tell us a bit about that experience and how winning that competition changed everything for you? <laughs> um, well, you said it there. Um, I didn't intend for any of this to happen. I, I was not, there was not a goal uh, in my mind to, to um, be on TV or even be sharing recipes in the way that I am. I've, I've always loved cooking um, for my family and my loved ones. Um, and ever since I was a kid, my, my family was in a, a car accident when I was about four years old. 
and uh, my, my dad passed away and I saw, um, I saw how much the literal like lot broken laundry baskets of casseroles that neighbors and friends brought to my mom meant to her and how re relief filled she was when those showed up on the doorstep. Um, just as a little nod to here you go. Um, I'm here to help you. And that is by feeding you. And I saw how much love you could convey in that. So I've always loved food and that's kind of been its role in my life is this, uh, little like love note to everybody um, I cook for but I never really thought I would do it for a living um, I am a early bird I am not a night hawk so I I wouldn't I'm not a restaurant I could not do restaurant life um, I have so much respect for everyone who does um, baking definitely would have been the avenue if I if I had have gone into uh, cooking professionally without MasterChef. Um, but I, I kind of went a different route. And, and one of the reasons I was so excited when you, you guys reached out to me was um, I did my undergrad in history and English. And I did my master's in information, um, which a lot of people in information go uh, into library sciences and library studies. Um, I was actually looking at more the archiving route. I, I really wanted to go into archiving. But after your master's, you, you don't have any money and you get a job in an office. So I started working as an insurance broker, which was definitely not in the cards. And while very informative, not the most uh, me job, I think, out there. Um, so I had a, a girlfriend who was just relentlessly uh, urging me to try out for MasterChef Canada because she was like, you're good enough. It's great. Um, to be honest, I thought she was lying and she was just trying to get me to cook for her more by, t by complimenting me and making me feel good about my food. Um, so when I went to the audition and, and got a call back and then made it onto the show and then made it through the first episode, um, I was more shocked than I think anybody um, but, but cooking my way through that kitchen, um, and luckily meeting such amazing people while doing it. The other, the other home cooks on my season were some of the, are some of the best people, uh, I know. And, and so brilliant, um, really kind of helped shape everything. And, and from there, I mean, I equate it to the world's craziest culinary boot camp because you're there, you're cut off from the world basically and you're told to cook and you don't know what you're going to cook. And then it just happens and you just have to start uh, uh, head down and going. Um, and it, it was such a, a formative experience for me and so fun. Um, and also introduced me to the world of, of um, TV production and, and things like that. And there's so much to learn from cameras and sound to uh, keeping things hot for long enough that it's okay to keep eating them and things like that. Um, that it was so interesting. That that kitchen was the most, everyone always asks if I could do it again. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm, I, am, uh, I, am, I am a stress case at the best of times. And it was so stressful, but also like an experience I would never trade um, with or without what has happened since. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mary, for your honesty, and um, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. And I'm sure that uh, had a major role in shaping your life and what you wanted to do. Um, so I've heard you say your mother was a big uh, influence in in what you chose to do with your life. Can you tell us a little bit about your mom? Yeah. So, like, I mean, I feel like I've given her a bad rap because my mom was <laughs> not much of a cook. Um, she was, we, we were, um, mainstays at a couple of local restaurants ever since I was four. Um, we, oh gosh, we ate out at restaurants probably, I feel like <laughs> probably four nights a week. Um, cause my mom, she, the last thing she wanted to do after she ran her own business, the last thing she wanted to do was cook for two kind of picky kids. And I get that. Um, but I think that's also kind of helped shape the way that I cook and the way that I, um, I try to uh, get other people to cook. Because for me, um, the cooking is great. I love it so much. But I never want, similar to this recipe, I never want to make someone try harder than they have to. So my whole goal is to uh, make the recipe 20% effort and 80% payoff where you can enjoy it um, and you don't have to dread doing it like my mom so did. 
because I think I, I get so much joy out of it and I just want to kind of impart that on anybody who, who gets into the kitchen to try some of my recipes. Um, but yeah, no, I did not learn it her knee. That, that was not a, I mean, she does make a good mac and cheese, but like that's, that's the uh, extent of it. Okay. Um, well, thank you for explaining that. Um, are you still in touch with some of the former contestants of that season? Yeah, I was actually, um, I've got my, my, the runner up from my season, Jeremy, who was there. Uh, I remember meeting him on the first day. Uh, we are, he's getting married soon and he's got two little girls and uh, uh, they know who I am and I'm going to the wedding and anytime Jeremy's in town, uh, we are hard pressed to not hang out. Like we are, he is one of the best people I've ever met. And um, Veronica Cham, who was also on my season, she, I believe, made it to the top four. Um, she, uh, I was in her wedding. I was one of her bridesmaids. Um, uh, Matthew, who, he wore the hats. He's a, a great <laughs> friend. There's, there's so many people. Dr. Sean, who's from Montreal, um, now in New York. He's a doctor. Uh, like, <laughs> doctor, which my mom, when he first, she first met him, thought he was a DJ. Because he... He wears the clothes of a DJ, but is a doctor. Um, I, all those people are, are people that I couldn't imagine my life without now. And I didn't go into it. I wasn't a summer camp kid. I, I was kind of jealous of kids who were summer camp kids, but I, I've never been one to... Um, I, you don't really go into a situation like that and expect to make such great friends because you, you are competing. Like, you are not adversaries, but you are... If you... Don't, if you win, they lose. And that's kind of a weird place to make friends, but it really kind of solidified everything. So they're great. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your cookbook and how, how that whole thing all came together. Oh man, that was a huge shock. Um, I, my first cookbook came out last September. Um, I just actually am working on edits on my second cookbook and finishing pictures and stuff, which is amazing and totally um, unexpected, but wonderful. Um, but that actually came about, uh, I've always dreamed, it, in terms of um, dreams from when I was a kid, I've always dreamed of writing a cookbook. Never of having a TV show or anything like that, all these other amazing things that, that I, I now get to do. Um, but the cookbook thing was just uh, a, a pipe dream for me. Um, and I was lucky to meet and be introduced to, uh, uh, Robert McCullough, who is the, the president of Appetite, um, by Random House, which is an imprint and they do cookbooks, obviously. Um, and it was, it, you know, when you meet someone and it's like kindred spirits, um, we met, uh, we talked about, uh, obviously cookbooks. We talked about food. We talked about music and we talked about Mary Tyler Moore, where if you want to do that, I'm going to be your best friend. So, um, luckily we, we developed a really great working relationship. And, um, from there I met my amazing editor and, um, and everybody it's been, to be honest, I was nervous coming from, um, well, secondary and, and master's studies and stuff where there's not. There's some review, like there's some peer review, but usually you write something, you hand it in, you get your mark and you're done. Like there's no, there's not a ton of, until you go into your PhD side, there's not a ton of back and forth. It's kind of, you do the work and you're, you wash your hands and go. Um, whereas this, I was a little nervous that I was going to turn into a petulant teenager uh, when my editor came back with notes on my writing and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, but I loved every second of it. I, I, I really loved the, the, the breaking down of, of the words that I use too much and the, the figuring out what my kind of ticks are and, and how the best way to, to convey a simple recipe in a simple way that gives enough information. Um, but it doesn't feel like it's just for beginners. Cause I think that's, that's the trick. There's beginner cookbooks and then there's advanced cookbooks. And I wanted to write something that could be used by both um, and, and have great results. So uh, will you be continuing with Random House for the, the next cookbook? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm with them again for this one. And uh, um, it's a busier year, surprisingly, but with uh, writing a cookbook during a pandemic is kind of weird, um, but it's been it's been great. I, I I'm a bit of a creature of habit, so now that I've 
worked with the, uh, this team, I'm, I'm, I'd be hard pressed to, to leave because I, I just love them so much. So you've also done some work as a food expert on various shows. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been a, a food expert on um, mainly CTV shows on, on Your Morning and Marilyn Dennis and The Social. Um, and it is, it's just another way to kind of get recipes out to people and, and teach people and try to convey how much fun I have and hopefully um, impact them to also have fun to, to get into the kitchen. Um, but it's been amazing. Uh, it's, it's also a fun challenge because when you're when I'm doing a recipe for your morning, say, that airs bright and early in the morning, I'm going to make a different recipe. I'm going to showcase a different recipe than I would on Marilyn Dennis. And that's because if you're in, in the before times when we actually had to leave for work, um, if you're running out the door, you don't want to hear somebody telling you to braise something for seven hours or, or anything like that. You want something quick that you can do that night. And so that's a really fun way to kind of showcase those quick, easy, delicious and simple recipes that you can actually get done that night with what you have in your pantry. Whereas the Marilyn Dennis show is a little bit more involved. It's a little more fun and, and um, I'd almost say like trendy, like uh, those, those different recipes that pop up all over the internet and online and Pinterest and everything like that. That's kind of where I get to showcase those and get kind of, um, have fun experimenting with what other people are experimenting with right now. Um, like when everyone was going bonkers for sourdough at the beginning of this, that was so fun for me because I got to kind of showcase uh, what I do with sourdough. And um, to me, the most interesting part of sourdough is the discard, the stuff that you throw away every single day when you're feeding it. Um, but what can you do with it? Especially right now when you don't want to throw stuff out, how can you use that to make something delicious, uh, even though it technically was going to get tossed in the garbage. So we talked a bit about uh, Master Chef, and we talked about your experience with the cookbook and working as a food expert. Um, so how about television? So this is your second television show, if I understand correctly, uh, Mary's <laughs> Kitchen Crush. So how did you get into TV, and how are, have those experiences been? Um, I, to be honest, I, it's funny. A, a lot of people will ask, how did you do this? Like, how did you, and I, I, I know it's a terrible answer, but it's, it was kind of just like the, the dominoes and the cards were all in alignment and everything just kind of, um, worked. I, I, um, I was the kid, I, I even in school plays and anything like that, I was always doing the set. Like I wasn't, I didn't want to be on stage. I wanted to be behind the scenes because I find it really interesting um, doing all that stuff. I, other than in university, I did a couple plays, but they were silly and fun. Um, but I, on MasterChef, on the set, um, it's a massive production. There's so many people, there's hundreds of people who work on that show, um, during production, during pre-production, during post, there's all these people and getting to meet those people, getting to, um, to be honest, bug them about what does that button do on your camera? How does, how does a microphone work? Which to be honest, if I knew would be probably much better for the sound today. Um, <laughs> but there's, um, there's all, all different things to learn and, and you're never going to know everything. And to me, that's one of the reasons I love cooking and being in the kitchen is that no matter what, you're never going to know everything. There's always going to be a recipe or a food you haven't tried. There's always going to be a technique that you could perfect or, or do differently to be more efficient. There's all these different things that we could do. Um, and it's similar kind of in, in the TV world. Um, so I, I was lucky to, to uh, meet the producers at, at MasterChef, um, who own a, a large production company, um, Proper, um, under a Boat Rocker um, is the production company. And, uh, and they just wanted to, they, they saw something that maybe would work and, um, and wanted to kind of develop something with me. And uh, I've been, I've been really lucky, I think, in that I've had, um, I had kind of my, my upbringing in the MasterChef Canada kitchen because audiences got to know truly who I am. They got to, I, when I think about how many times people who watch that show have seen me cry, it's very weird, but, um, 
but it, it, it was, um, it was an introduction to me fully because you can't, there's no time to pretend while you're in that kitchen because there's just so much happening and you have to just focus. Um, so when it came to doing shows, um, it was always very much based on who I am and there was never a, um, okay, let's, let's take this bit of her personality and leave this bit out. Um, because everybody already knew the full package and it would be weird if you kind of started cutting away at it now. Um, so it was, it was, it's been amazing. And the people at Bell, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I count myself lucky to get to work with such great people and also so many women. Um, I was raised by a single mom. I've got a lot of really strong, powerful single ladies and ladies in my family and getting to work with companies that are owned and run by women and, and, and um, have really high up positions where women are, are making the calls um, is really amazing to me and makes me feel comfortable because that's, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to my mom and she's, a, she's kind of a boss. It was nice to see you win that season because you were the first female contestant to win. So that was exciting. Um, so back to cooking, can you tell us about one of your favorite recipes? Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of a bit of a goldfish sometimes when it comes to recipes. Cause I'm like, Ooh, that last one I made or ate was my favorite. Um, but I would have to say, in terms of like just basic recipes, I love making bread. Um, I love doughs. I love how a different combination of flour and either yeast or baking powder and, and different fats and water and, and liquids can make so many different things. Um, and it's fun. It reminds me of being a kid and playing with Play-Doh uh, and, and just getting to get your hands like dirty um, while creating something and nothing smells like fresh baked bread and nothing tastes like fresh baked bread. Um, so that's probably one of my favorites, but in terms of what I love cooking and when my friends and family come over, when our, when our bubble can get together or, or when we could have dinner parties, um, there's nothing like a roast, like a roast chicken, whether that's, um, kind of a more, uh, uh, comfy style, like a coq au vin or uh, stews and, or just a classic golden brown, perfect roast chicken. There are a few things that make people as excited and feel at home as, as the smell of that. That potatoes, roasted veg, you cannot go wrong. So what would be your favorite meal? Well, my favorite meal is breakfast uh, in general. <laughs> I am, uh, I've never been one to not eat breakfast. I love it um, in all its forms. Like I love sugar cereal. I love all of that stuff. But I think my favorite would have to be a tie between um, eggs Florentine or like, a, like an eggs Benedict with salmon and, and spinach and things like that. Cause I love hollandaise so much. Um, or uh, like a classic French omelet. Because basically, a classic French omelet is like, it's almost like a, just a golden omelet filled with sort of hollandaise. It's amazing. So are there any chefs right now that are inspiring you? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I, um, I mean, in terms of like the world of, of TV chefs and things like that, I've always been truly obsessed with Ina Garten, the Barefa Contessa. Um, she does just brilliant and amazing things. Um, then there's, there's people also who are food writers and, and stuff who, who really inspire me. There's a, a woman named Julie Van Rosendahl, um, based out of Calgary who she writes for the Globe and Mail. She wrote, she, she writes cookbooks. She does a ton of stuff. She has a new cookbook out on uh, dirty food and it's just the food you want to eat. Um, and she does such amazing things. As soon as the pandemic started, she kind of uh, I don't know if she got them together, but she was part of a group that was making lunches for kids who normally would depend on school lunches uh, to, to eat in the day. Um, and basically just having them on a table, like ready to drop off hundreds and hundreds of meals a day. Um, she's amazing. Um, in terms of out here, I mean, I love Chuck Hughes. Who doesn't love Chuck Hughes in terms of like Canadian cooks? Like, come on, dream. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton. And, and obviously the, the chefs from MasterChef, Michael Bonaccini is truly a Renaissance man finding out that he actually knows how to, like he, he has like a country home and he does, all of the kind of outdoorsy stuff. Whereas when you see him on TV, you think he just drinks tea and wears nice clothes. <laughs> like, um, so it, it's great kind of knowing those people. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so what is that? What was I going to ask you next? Um, what would your last meal be? Oh, Okay, so <laughs> this is a thing I made on Mary's, well, it's not even a meal, it's just one dish. Um, I made it on my show, Mary's Kitchen Crush, uh, for a Thanksgiving episode. And it is, so it's the second thing my mom can make. And it is a potato casserole. And it looks like 1965 came to the party and isn't going to leave until you eat a boatload of potatoes. It's like mashed potatoes with it sounds horrible, so don't judge me, but this is 100% what I would want. Mashed potatoes with sour cream and cream cheese mashed into them. And then they're topped with butter, obviously. And then they're topped with, and this is where it gets really weird, crushed cornflakes and cheddar cheese. <laughs> and it is, I look for, I, I only, she only makes it at, at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I look forward to it every year. And if I make it myself, it's delicious but it's not the same as when my mom makes it. Um, and I think, I think those recipes are the ones that speak to me most, the ones that um, made by the hand who makes them and you cannot replicate it. Like, you know, those ones where they're just perfect as is. So don't even try. Very interesting. Not what I expected, but very oh, interesting. I, always, I do these things and I feel like I blow up my spot being like, Oh yes, I like fancy food. But then I tell you I would eat mashed potatoes or cream cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so the word kitchen and the idea of kitchen really is central to a lot of what you do. We see you now in your kitchen, the word kitchen is in your cookbook, in your show, in your previous show. So tell us a little bit about this. Uh, first, I, I actually had never drawn that line before. So thank you. That is actually really beautiful. Um, for me, the kitchen is kind of the, um, it, 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 I mean, everybody says it already, but it's the heart of the home. It's where... Um, it's where my shoulders drop. It's where I feel um, kind of at, at peace with whatever happened in the day, good, bad, ugly, whatever. Um, and, and standing uh, here prepping stuff or standing at the stove stirring or smelling what I'm making um, kind of just makes me feel good. Um, and I think the kitchen is kind of, at, at least in every home I've lived in, has always been the place where everybody hangs out. Um, whether that's in this current my apartment kitchen, um, where to be honest, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a dance. It's a bit of a chess match when we have people over and there's 15 people in here and I'm trying to get something off the stove, but, um, it, the kitchen or the kitchen in my mind that, that is kind of the dream kitchen is one where everyone feels at home. Everyone feels like they can go into the fridge and grab another drink or have a bite of something. Um, there's a plate of cookies, and if there's one left, you can eat it. It's not you don't have to save it. Just just dig in, um, and it's just the place where everybody comes together and, and talks about their day and and kind of comes together as a family or comes together with themselves and, and figures out um, the good about what's going on. Because even if you've had the worst day ever. You can count on your favorite chocolate chip cookie recipe to turn out and turn your day around. Um, you know? Yes. Yes, I know exactly. I agree, Mary. Sometimes when you've had the worst day, just having a good meal yes. turns everything around. Completely. Completely. So let me see um, if we have any questions from the audience. So just a second, and um, if anyone has a question, please use the Q&A, and I will ask Mary your question for you. How long have you guys been doing this? This is, it was, it's been amazing, and I, I think it's a, a wonderful thing to do. Again, it brings people together, which is awesome. We've started this uh, telephone line and Zoom uh, back in March, maybe end of March, start of April. We're getting a little bit better at it now, more comfortable with Zoom. At the beginning, it wasn't so easy, but uh, we're all learning as we go. 
Uh, so I see a question now, Mary. Who is your favorite person to cook for? Oh, that'd be my husband. He's sitting over there. <laughs> um, he is the, um, to be honest, he's, he's my favorite person to cook for, but not when I'm trying to develop a recipe. If I'm trying to develop a recipe for TV or for cookbooks, he's arguably the worst because he just likes everything, which is a good problem to have. Um, but I, no one gets as excited about literally anything I make. It could be the world's worst scrambled eggs or, or something to leftovers reheated or repurposed into something else. And he is so excited every time I put something down. Um, and I love cooking for him. It's, it's nice to not, it's nice to not be married to a picky eater first off. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's also really great to be married to someone who's so, um, appreciative. Um, it, 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 especially when some days when I'm doing cookbook photos or a lot of recipe testing for shows, when there's literally, I'll be making 10 things a day, like 10 dinners and he'll love every single one of them, which is great. I mean, if I really need though, someone to give me honest feedback, his sister is my go-to. She, she can cut, cut to the, cut to the chase, which I appreciate. Okay, perfect. So you beat me to that question. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our audience members and one of my colleagues says, I guess your husband will get to eat the strawberry shortcakes today. <laughs> I mean, I also already made uh, oatmeal cookies this morning because I did a, a TV thing this morning. So we, we've got a lot of sweets going on. So oh, a, a special treat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the other question that came in is, have you eaten in any restaurants in Montreal? Mm. Um, oh, my goodness. I, and pasto is one of my favorites. Um, like, cannot the, the salt, the flavor profiles, the pasta, every single thing I've had there has been amazing. And they have amazing wine. Um, so, so good. Um, I mean, all of uh, Michelle Forgione's um, kind of restaurants in that kind of corner, there's like the little ones, all of them are good. The pizza place is amazing. Um, but Montreal is such um, a great place because there's so much food. There's also a place, I think it's still open, but I haven't been to Montreal in about a year, um, but it's called Chu Chai. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I believe it's a vegan kind of Thai fusion restaurant and they make these peanut dumplings that I have been known to go there, get two orders of those, um, to eat before I go to another dinner reservation. Like truly, I've done that before going to a pasto, not because I'm not looking forward to the food there, but because I just have to eat those dumplings. I, I'll order one and then as soon as they land, I know I need another one and I'll immediately place an order even before eating them. That's great. Uh, another foodie question from, uh, this is a Montreal foodie question. So smoked meat or bagels? Bagels. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I cannot, I mean, we can't, we don't have, we don't have good bagels here in Toronto. We've got, um, I feel like Toronto bagels, even when people try to do kind of the Montreal style, either they've come from Montreal and are delicious, but aren't that fresh, just like hot, still deliciousness. Um, but there, there's, I feel like a lot of bagels that are here are kind of like a mix between like New York and Montreal style. And New York bagels can get out of here. They're too doughy. I don't, I want chewy. You want caramelized kind of honey -y flavor and so many and I'm a poppy seed girl so so many poppy seeds I cannot I bet bagels and also pickles because pickles that go with smoked meat are not in my opinion <laughs> so if any of us eventually do get to Toronto what are your restaurant recommendations over there amazing yeah um so there's a couple um, one of my favorite places for a glass of wine and maybe a, a delicious um, appetizer or even just a meal, kind of classic French bistro style is Le Slec Bistro um, on Wellington. It's amazing. My husband and I actually got married there. Um, their wine cellar is the size of our current apartment, I feel like. It is, it's amazing. Um, but I think my, my favorite kind of 
two restaurants and they're owned by the same people are uh, Union 72 um, and uh, Cote de Boeuf. So those are two, Cote de Boeuf is very meat heavy and they do all their butchering and all their charcuterie and everything in house. Um, and Union is just like, I've never had a bad meal there. They always have really interesting wines. It's really, really delicious. And I've been known to order for dessert their fries with their mayonnaise because <laughs> um, it's so tasty. But, uh, and then in terms of pastries and things, um, there's a little shop. I, I live in the, currently I live in the Parkdale area of Toronto and up on Queen Street, uh, there's a little uh, um, cafe called The Tempered Room and they do the best croissant I've had since I've been in Paris. Like they're, they're so delicious perfectly kind of dark golden brown color and they are amazing so do they have the amazin croissants with the almonds on the top oh my gosh yes and it's so good they they are they are a treat they're sweet and the french pan inside is i i can't even i can't i can't it, they're so and they, they oh my gosh it's so good they weigh a lot because they really load it full of that, that frangipan and it's sweet and delicious, but oh my goodness, I can not think of a better one. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. So I see another question coming in here. The question is, uh, what was your worst cooking disaster? Oh, oh, I got, I mean, I've, I've had burns. I've had all those as, as I think everybody who's in the kitchen has had. Um, but I think in terms of the most memorable cooking disaster, I would have to say the first time I cooked for my now husband, I was, we met in university. So I, I think it was 19 or 20. Um, and I made, we were going, he was taking me to a play and I made pasta. I don't know how I messed up pasta first off, insane. Um, but I made this like roasted vegetable sauce and nothing tasted like anything and things got burnt. Like it was, it was comical how bad it was, especially I, I was mortified because I had been kind of bragging. I was like, um, I'm a great cook. <laughs> And then I, I totally ruined it. But luckily he didn't notice too much because I think, you know, when you're on a first date and your your pat your your tongue doesn't like your your taste buds don't work because you're too excited. That's so I feel like that worked on my side a little bit. Thank you, Mary. I think that's all the questions we have for you today. And I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us and to invite us into your kitchen and to share a recipe and for us to learn more about you. So thank you again so much. To you and to your publisher for making this possible. Thank you. And we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. And feel free to share the recipe too, because uh, it's easy and I hope everybody enjoys. Okay, so I'll just repeat before we go to the audience that your website is a small oven. Stove. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a small stove dot com. So you can get Mary's recipes there and we'll make sure also uh, to have this information available on the library's website. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. It was super fun. I'm going to go eat this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.